You've already had a big day, a full day, a busy day. Um, and I hope to, uh, hope to keep you energetic for one more hour. So first of all, my name is Steve Bell. I really want to thank all of you, uh, particularly uh, Jim and Al, for asking me to be here. Um, I am honored. I am inspired. I am humbled. I am a lot of things right now, as I'm sure all of you are. What an incredible room we have. Um, my topic is... And this sounds a little pithy, but really, I mean, this, can we change the world? Are we changing it already in small ways? And how do we scale that? I, this is a great photo. I think everybody um, can identify with this photo. My wife took this photo 91 days ago. So this is real. This is um, this that those eyes just tell it for me. So what I want to do is start out with an exercise. I want to start out with a one minute exercise. On all of your tables, there should be a small stack of index cards. Is there an index card stack? Everybody take two, just two, and a pen. And here's what I want you to do. I didn't know about the exercises we were already going to do today and have done today, but this is a mini experiment. Let's call this a small data experiment, not a big data experiment. What I want you each to do is connect with your passion. There is an awful lot of passion in this room, okay? We all talked a lot about values very recently. We all talked a lot about purpose. We all talked a lot about passion. What I would like you all to do in three words, not four, not two, but three separate words in one minute, so we won't overthink this, what is connecting you and your purpose and your passion with this thing we call lean systems thinking. Okay, go. Uh, one card, three ideas, save the second card for later. second mark. Okay, be careful not to overthink. Okay, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so keep that handy. Keep that kind of in the back of your mind as I talk for the next few minutes. And we'll return to this card at the end of the session, all right? So first of all, I want to introduce you all to an organization, Lean for NGO. Um, this is an organization um, I began, my wife and I, very modestly about two years ago. This organization is a gathering spot. It's a watering hole. It's a forum. The intent, the long-term intent of Lean for NGO is to connect three communities in this world. The one community is us in this room. The other community are the um, NGO, nonprofit leadership organizations, those people that need to know what we know so they can do more with less. And then perhaps most of all, those people who are funding those efforts. So they need to understand what this thing called Lean is all about too. And if we can make those three come together and tell some stories, I think we can really start something here um, for the other 90% of the world. So there are a couple of models that um, I have used. I was part of creating one other nonprofit years ago. And these are the two inspirations for this. Um, there's a book years ago called The Starfish and the Spider. Has anybody read it? Rod Baxter, Murray Brothman. Um, they predicted the world of social networking, and then social networking happened. It's an amazing book, and I think there are some models, there are some metaphors in this book uh, for what we're doing here for the Lean System Society. The other book I've heard come up many times today in conversation is Made to Sick by the Brothers at Stanford. Um, these two books are how I have in mind that Lean for NDO should work. I don't own it. 
I've created a space, like we've created a space here today, and the rest is up to everyone, the community, to figure out how it works, to come together, to tell stories, because I believe in the world of NGO practice in particular, telling stories is what inspires action. And I think we're all pretty good storytellers in this room. So that's Lean for NGO. Now, let's think about Lean in the for-profit world. It started in manufacturing, certainly. Rapid product development and operational excellence. It's moved into supply chain. It's moved very effectively into healthcare. It's moved into technology development and delivery. It's moved quite strongly into financial services, the financial service sector, improving access, diversity of services, lower transaction costs. Look what's happening in Kenya, where mobile phones are banks. Yeah. So, and then in the public sector, okay? So lean has spread throughout all of these domains. So what does lean thinking have to do with NGOs? And I would like to suggest it has everything to do. What you're looking at are the eight millennium development goals uh, established by the United Nations back in the year 2000. We set some goals. I'm, they are, because you may not be able to read those, one is eradicate extreme poverty and hunger. Two is achieve universal primary education. Three is promote gender equality and empower women. Four is reduce child mortality. Fifth is improve maternal health. Six, combat HIV, AIDS, malaria, and other diseases. Seven, ensure environmental sustainability. And eight, finally, global partnership for development because no single organization, governmental or otherwise, can do it alone. It's all about partnerships, okay? Now, if you'd like to go to the Millennium Development Goals 2013 report, you'll find a copy of that report posted on the Lean Brand Deal site. And it will tell you that we are actually making surprising progress on many of these, but we are making no progress at all on many of these others. So, yes, he's wrong. Yes. Uh, I, am, I am giving this as an example of the United Nations view of humanitarian effort relief of creating a more sustainable planet where everyone's standard of living is raised up. This is a systems thinking view of all of the elements that go into that because you could fix any one of these elements, but you will not raise people up without fixing the others as well. Yes. Yes. It's about any kind of CEO. Any, any, um, as you'll learn later, anyone who is in the business, for-profit or non-for-profit, of serving others can benefit from lean thinking, okay? And it's not my company. I took the step of creating a space and uh, populating it with stories, and that's as far as I'm going for now, and some amazing things are happening with it, as you'll see. But I declare no ownership of this. It belongs to everyone. Now, the one I want to focus on for a minute is my particular passion, because I've been involved in microfinance for over a decade. Eradicating extreme poverty and hunger. Because if you can't do that, um, kids won't go to school, health care won't happen, nothing happens. Every one of these, you could make that argument. But this is my passion and has been for years. So a quick comment on what is poverty, a lot of discussions on what is poverty. There's absolute poverty, there's relative poverty. Yes, we do have poverty in this country. Yes, we do have hunger in this country, and there's no doubt about it. But it is on a different scale from what you might experience if you go to other parts of this world. Um, the, the best place to go for a real definition of it, Jeffrey Sachs has written a number of books, The End of Poverty is one of them, where he gives this pyramid. And the 2 billion to 3 billion people living at the bottom of the pyramid at less than $2 a day. The 1.1, I believe it's up to 1.3 billion people now living at the very bottom of the pyramid don't know where they're going to sleep tonight and they don't know what they're going to eat next or when. Okay. Yes. Are you going to talk to white? Not in one hour. No. But... That is a great five whys. Follow that to the root cause. You follow that to the root cause and you'll get back to 
the reason these were established as the cults. Okay, but that's a great question. So I just wanted to put this up because we could talk for a long time on what poverty is. The point I want to make for this crowd is poverty is a systemic condition. It can't be easily solved. You can't really ever solve it because the moment you solve one piece of it, something else pops up and takes its place. So it is something that we need to attack on multiple fronts. And it's something, one thing we have learned in the last decade or two is it's something others can't do to you. It is something you as a community have to do for yourselves. You need help, but it's something you need to do for yourselves or else it's not sustainable. We're not talking charity here. We're talking empowering and naval help, okay? Um, and that's what I think lean systems thinking is all about, is what we just talked about in the last hour, okay? <clears throat> now, who is better hot on the trail of this than the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation? They have extremely high standards for business practices and measurement-driven programs where they're getting beneath some of these things. They really are showing some significant outcomes and they are a learning organization. Every year they put out an annual report, they call it the annual letter. Here's the 2013 report. Again, if you want to, want to download a copy of the full report, you'll find a copy of this posted on the Lean for NGO site. And in this report, I did a little of my own small data analysis. I looked for the appearance of certain words in this report. The word improve appears 40 times in this report. The word measure appears 38 times in this report. The word learn appears 17 times in this report. And the word process appears six times in this report. Not bad. The words lean and sigma appear zero. Okay. Now, these are really smart people. And I know right across the highway up in Redmond, there are a few hundred scrum teams, and there are a lot of lean thinkers in Redmond. So I don't believe that the folks at Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation don't know about lean thinking, but they're not making it explicit. But the principles are there, and that's enough for starters. So what can we do with that? Okay, What are we doing with that? So in the belief that stories inspire action, my stories, I hope, will inspire your action. I hope you have stories that you can share with others that will inspire others to action. That's what I think we're really trying to do here, is create that action. I want to tell you four stories that have come directly or indirectly as a result of Lean for NGO and the fact that there are other people like me, other people like us out there that think the same way, that share these same values. I'm going to tell you a story about Mercy Corps Northwest. <coughs> I'm going to tell you a story about World Vision, CCBRT, and finally the Coupe de Gras, my, my story about uh, Grameen Foundation, where those, some of these photos you've seen have come from. The two I mentioned here, Mercy Corps and Grameen, both received significant funding from the Gates Foundation, and we already have a connection there that we're working, trying to get some of these stories to work themselves back upstream for better familiarity. So let me tell you first about Mercy Corps Northwest. This is my story. Because Mercy Corps, how many of you have heard of Mercy Corps International? They are one of the, if you go out on the list of the 100 most influential NGOs in the annual report, they're near the top of the list. They are a development aid organization. Um, they're an incredible organization. They're in 40 countries now. But they have a domestic arm, and that domestic arm is in Portland, Oregon. That's my home. And that's where their headquarters is. And Mercy Corps Northwest has a microfinance, a small business lending program based in Portland that's serving the Pacific Northwest. Most microfinance is directed at poor countries, developing countries, but this is a case where microfinance can work at home. You can see the statistics here. The loan size is much larger than you would see in a traditional microfinance organization. Most microfinance loans are in the 100 to 500 to maybe $2,000 range, okay? But this is the, because the barriers of entry in the United States are much bigger. This is more of an SBA program, a combination of SBA and microfinance. And they originally called on me about three or four years ago and said, hey, we, we need some help here. We need to scale, but we can't add headcount. Well, what can we do about that? So we stood up a team. We did some value stream mapping. 
We did some A3s, we did some measurements, and we did, this is Kaizen number one. This was several years ago. They're well on their way past this, but I wanted to show you what our first intervention in about 90 days yielded. From the time you go onto their website and say, hey, I want a loan. I want to start up a fertilizer business or a yard care business or a coffee barista business or whatever, and I need $10,000. To the time you, the, the, the loan application was looked at and processed, I'm not talking about the time you got your money, just the time when the initial application process was 17 days. And the process time, the actual hands-on time was 105 minutes. Okay, typical lean result. The end of this one Kaizen, our target, we got it from 17 days down to three days. And the actual, when we actually started measuring it, was down to 1.1 days. And the process time went from 105 minutes down to our target of 40 minutes down to 15 minutes. Okay? And right there, they sat back and they said, hey, not bad after 90 days. Do you think we have any other ways to run this organization? And the word started to spread. We started putting up visuals. We started to spread beyond the domestic organization, then there started to be more and more interest on the international side. Um, the outcomes, the value realized, their client experience improved, the quality of the applications improved, because if they got a, an inappropriate application on day one, they could get back to them on day two and say, hey, you know, you're missing some stuff. And you might not be wanting to talk to us. We might want to suggest you go over and talk to the SBA or go talk to a banker. Okay, so right away, there, there was a feedback loop, a quick feedback loop to those who they were trying to serve, okay? Um, increased approval rates for those loans that did come through, staff efficiency increased, the scalability increased, and finally, they're in the business of modeling professional behavior. And so they were showing their applicants how to do better process work. So it was a win for everybody. So this was a, was a great example, one great example. This was 15 minutes from my house by car, 10 minutes by bike, because it's down here. This was close to home. Now I challenge you to think, do any of you have a worthy nonprofit within 15 minutes or a half an hour of your home that could use an hour or two of your help every week or two? Because that's all I did, that's all it took. I happened to have a ringer, the fellow who is the, uh, the co-executive director of this organization happened to have owned a manufacturing company and happened to have had his only transformation years ago. So he is ready to hit the ground running. I'm not saying you'll always find that, but you'll find someone within the organization who will be the champion to help that. So um, it was amazing how quickly this happened. Okay. So that's story number one. Story number two I want to tell you is about a guy named Mike Grogan who called me about a year ago. He's a young guy. He's pictured right here. He was a Lean Six Sigma champion at Merck Pharmaceuticals. He went on what he thought was a pleasure trip to Tanzania. He got to Tanzania, and within two days of being on the ground, his life changed. He went, oh my God, I heard about poverty, and now I see it. And the, now that I've seen it, I have to do something about it. Within six months, he had quit his job. When he was boarding the airplane, he told his parents, he's been there six months now, he's blogging. All of his blogs are posted on leanfrangio.org. They're, they're, they're posted in the, in the LinkedIn discussion group area, and they'll link you to his site. And let me tell you, he has, this guy has some passion going. And um, he, he, he was, his focus is maternal health and child health. He was doing a hospital gamble one day, and he walked by a table where there were three newborn infants that were sitting on a table that were left to die because they knew they couldn't live. And so they were left to die so the doctors could go on to focus on the, on the infants that could be saved. Okay, think about it. What would you think if you saw that? And you said to yourself, can I do something about that? Well, they are doing something about that. This is just in the first few months. They are starting to see some improvement on neonatal deaths, on maternal deaths. They're doing workshops. The doctor that's the leader of this organization is in these workshops. Their leadership team, their doctors are in there, their nurses are in there. I encourage you to go up to Lean Frangio, read some of this guy's blogs, and tell me if you're not moved by this. Now, this is one guy who just picked up and moved, just like that. Okay, 
So that's the story. The next story is about World Vision International. How many of you have heard of World Vision International? A few of you. They're one of the largest uh, NGOs in the world. They're a faith-based organization based out of California. About $4 billion annual turnover in revenues. About 40,000 employees on the ground. This is not a small organization. And about a year ago, the fellow who is starting their Lean Six Sigma program there, who came out of aerospace, by the way, <clears throat> moved to um, Kenya, um, took his family with him, and this is their roadmap. Looks a lot like Bush and Connery to me. Very focused, very focused. By the way, just an interesting point, the Lean program for World Vision International, this is piloting in East Africa, is a part of their global ICT. So their Lean Six Sigma program is part of their information communications technology program. Very interesting. And here's where they are right now. In the last year in the East Africa region, they've trained some green belts. They have over 400 staff and leaders in a program. Um, they're taking a very, very deliberate program rollout approach. Learn, do, teach. Learn, do, teach. Cycle, cycle, cycle. Build, build, build. And here are the preliminary results. There is nothing spectacular about what they're doing here, but when you add it all up, they are reducing the friction. They are reducing the waste. They are learning how to do more, more using less and just running the mechanisms of this organization. Okay. If, if I had put the name of a for-profit company up here and shown you these results, you would have gone, yeah, good stuff. But this is East Africa, folks. Okay, So it can be done. It can be done. And let me tell you, people living in these sort of conditions with what they've got, they are the most resourceful, creative, inventive people. So give them some basic tools. Give them a way to measure themselves and let them go. Okay. So this is my third story. My final story, and the one that I'm proudest about, is an organization called Grameen Foundation. Now, many of you may know of Dr. Muhammad Yunus, who won the Nobel Peace Prize several years ago. He's one of the people that was said to have created microfinance back in the 70s. Um, he got a classical economics degree out of Vanderbilt. In the mid 70s, he went back to Bangladesh to Chittagong University during the separation of Pakistan and Bangladesh from India and the, the huge civil war and famine and, and, and all of that. And he was teaching classical economics in the university while people were literally dying on the doorstep of his classroom. And he said to himself, something about classical economics is not working here. It might be working for the developed world, but it is not working for the 90% of the people who need the credit the most. And so he got a couple of his grad students and went out into a village and got the women in the village all in a circle. And he said, how much do you all need to break free of the money lenders to get your own base of assets so you have working capital, so you can start, so you can get your foot on the bottom rung of the economic ladder? And they said, $26. And he reached into his own pocket. He handed the money out. It was not charity. It was a loan. He got the money back. And these women now had an asset. For the first time, they had an asset. And that was the first step on the economic ladder. Until then, the money lenders, which exist in every economy, in the developing economy, they'll give you enough to get the working capital to, make, to feed your kids and buy your raw materials get you through the next week, but then they take most of it back again. So they deliberately keep you asset poor. Banks won't loan to those people. Microfinance goes looking for those people to help them develop self-sufficiency. There are now over 150 million people with microcredit loans, and there's over $10 billion in microcredit lending worldwide. There's over 4,000 microfinance institutions around the world who are doing this programmatically. It is enormous. Okay? So, yes. Oh my goodness. The uh, default rate on microfinance is about 1 to 2%. And the success people. Tremendous. Tremendous. Well documented. Yes, yes, well documented. Um, Mixmarket.org, M I X M A R K E T.org, is the one place you go where you see all of the microfinance organizations. 
and the all of the financials, full disclosure. Has anybody heard of Kiva.org? That's microfinance. $25. Don't buy, you know, your uncle a tie for Christmas. Go out and give him a $25 gift certificate, and uh, he gets his choice of who he funds. Okay. Oh, thank you. The question was, uh, would you repeat the question? Yeah. Has the sustainability of this been about? Yeah. Oh, and the question is, is, uh, is the democracy not including Because those are the dangers. I think. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, graft and, and politics and all of that. Uh, why microfinance works is the NGOs actually go into the country, they set up the infrastructure, the collection, the coaching. There's a lot of lean in microfinance because you go around the village once a week you meet with these groups these are teams these are self-organized self-supporting teams you help them problem solve you collect their pennies each week um, there's a tremendous story in fact if you're really interested in this here's the first book to read is dr Eunice's first book banker to the poor which tells the story from years ago that's a good one to start uh, and if you really get sucked into it there are a lot of other stories Every micro-financed, micro-entrepreneur is a lean startup. Okay? Every one of them. And there's lean startup is going through the microfinance community like wildfire right now. Just like wildfire, because it makes sense. Okay? So what happened, Dr. Eunice got the Nobel Peace Prize and an organization spawned off of Grameen Bank, which is based in Bangladesh. This organization is called Grameen Foundation, based in Washington, D.C., which became a base of operations to spread this throughout the world. So Grameen Foundation is supporting this kind of activity. They went to Microsoft many years ago, and they, with the cooperation and funding of Microsoft, built one of the first mobile money platforms. Because one of the, if you're gonna make microfinance work, if you're gonna send people on motorcycles and donkeys and bicycles doing a milk run every week around villages, you gotta have a way to account for that cash. You've, and so you basically have to have a way to go mobile and account for the accounting and then come back to the home office. And so they were pioneering in this. This has become a whole industry now 20 years later, but they were really the pioneers in this, okay? And that spread. My first interaction with Grameen Foundation was about three years ago when I spent a week pro bono in their Washington, D.C. offices with some of their executive leadership team. We did a value stream map. We did a Kaizen helping them on their HR onboarding process. Okay, and it was a great event and they're, they're still doing this, but it didn't really take. They said, wow, that's great. And then it didn't really take. Well, a couple of years later, the director of the Uganda operations was talking to the CIO, the IT director, who's been my contact, and he said, here's what we're trying to do in Uganda, and she said instantly, you need to talk to Steve Bell. Three years later, my wife and I were in Kampala. It happened that quickly. It was, it was just poised. It just took two years for the stars to align for that to happen. So now here's the interesting story. Grameen is associated with microfinance. And they develop mobile technology platforms for field-based operations in microfinance. Along the way, they learned a few things about deploying mobile technology into the field. And they, about a year ago, came up with this amazing aha epiphany. They said to themselves, we are not a microfinance organization anymore. Grameen Foundation is a mobile knowledge development organization. They changed their logo just a couple of months ago to this. Tell me what you see in this logo. What do you see in that logo? Come on. Who said that? That's their new logo. Cell phone signal strength. Everybody's got one of those on their cell phone, right? Developing countries have far better bandwidth than we do. I went way out to the middle of nowhere in, the, in Uganda and kept going at an hour, and they had four bars. What are you going to do with that? Okay, same Kenya, same. It, so 
What have they got? What can we build on? And what do those four bars symbolize? That means the ability to deliver enabling knowledge, capability, as far as you can go off the end of the earth, okay? That is Grameen Foundation. So they have figured out that they're in the business of knowledge. So along with that comes a new program called the Community Knowledge Worker Program. That's another one of my wife's photos. This is real. We were there. We went to Gamba. The Community Knowledge Worker Program is right now is in mobile finance. It's in healthcare in Ghana. And it's in agriculture in Uganda. Why Uganda? Uganda is this amazing agricultural wealth with desperately poor, agriculturally poor neighbors on every side. So Uganda feeds its neighbors. And it has plenty. There's a lot of poverty in Uganda, but there's no starvation. There's, there's no hunger. But there have been so many disruptive events in the last 20 years in Uganda. A lot of the learning of agricultural practices has been, the, the chain of knowledge has been broken. So what they're trying to do with this community knowledge worker program is boost the productivity, the agricultural output of the whole country by delivering knowledge to the field, gathering knowledge from the field and disseminating it out again. It's almost like a respiration process that's going on. Yes. Well, Idi Amin, uh, a lot of uh, men were lost in wars, a lot of um, change, a lot of people moving from the country to the city. So a lot of people, almost everybody, they call it digging, by the way. They don't call it farm. You say, well, what are you going to do this weekend? Oh, I'm going to dig. Everybody has a, a corn plot in their backyard. And if you're an entrepreneur, you have a big corn plot. So agricultural productivity is, is, is the lever that you need to move in Uganda. So you say, well, how do you do that? How do you do that? Well, you go out to these villages one by one and find someone in that village who is literate, who is creative, who is maybe a good experiential learner. You bring them in and you put them in a classroom. You teach them. You give them a smartphone. Uh, uh, Google is a sponsor of this program. They gave uh, a whole bunch of Droid phones, and they're learning from this too. Uh, Salesforce is a partner in this because Salesforce, their whole mobile communications, their whole, whole mobile outreach is based on force, built on force. Grameen is one of the key force presenters every year at the force conference. Um, so they went out, and right now, they're, I think they're, they're, they're over 1,100. I think they're around 12 to 1,300 now. They've got 1,300 people who are going around doing milk run routes on villages every week with a smartphone in their hand. They're asking questions like, well, what, what problem are you trying to solve this week? Is it a weather problem? Is it a fertilization problem? Is it a pest or a, or a disease problem? Is it a market pricing problem? What kind of problems do you have? And so you basically have community knowledge workers with phones going around, having stand-up meetings. They're sitting down, uh, but I was there. They're stand-up meetings talking about problems. Let me show you what that looks like. Oh, I'm sorry. Why they wanted me to come there first was they, they've done this once in Uganda, and it's been very successful, and it's growing, but they want to do it again. Their next project is in Cote d'Ivoire, which is on the other side of Africa. It's cocoa production, and it's French language. Okay, we've got a lot of things we've done before, but a lot of new things we want. They've got the Gates Foundation behind them saying, hey, you guys, this is great. We're ready to give you more money. Replicate this. Do this again. And they're sitting here going, we've done this once. How do we do it again and again and again? That's when the country director put out the call to say, how do we do this again? How do we make it repeatable? And uh, next thing you know, Karen and I are on a plane to Impala. So this is what it looks like. Um, the last mile. This is the last mile. You go as far as the roads end, and then you just keep going. And you get to these villages, literally grass huts. Although the, 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 the picture of a grass hut with a solar panel on top is kind of an interesting thing. Um, families, kids, goats, chickens, cows, cornfields surrounded by jungle. You get out in the middle of the no, nowhere, there are schools. The kids are in these schools. The schools don't have a concrete floor. They have a dirt floor, but these kids are in schools, okay? 
you go, you sit down under the shade of a tree because it's really hot with a circle of people and you have what I would say is a stand-up meeting, okay? And it looks like this. This is us having a stand-up meeting. That's, that's me. There's Kalud Oda, who's the IT director. She went on this uh, visit with us. There's my wife here. Here's our, here's our team that traveled for the day. We went to the Gemba. Um, we did that on day one because we had to know what we were dealing with. We had to have that experience. Um, so this is a picture of the phone. This is a picture of the charging unit, solar power charging unit, because there's no electricity out there. This little thing here, that's a light. So this charging unit not only has enough juice every day sitting in the sun all day to charge up the phone, it has a few hours worth of light so the kid can sit in the dark and do their homework or whatever it is. So this multi-purpose thinking, okay? So here's what's actually happening. This is the community knowledge worker and this is the farmer literally saying, we're having a problem with our corn right now and what happens is the top of the corn is turning black. We pull up the corn by the roots and we look and there looks like a fungus around the roots. We've never seen this before. What do we do? And literally, as this man in real time is describing it, this fellow is looking it up and about 30 seconds later, he hands the phone to this fellow and he says, is this what you've got? And he says, yeah, that looks like it. And then the phone gets passed around the whole crowd. Everybody gets a chance to say, is this what's going on? Yeah, is this happening in your field too? Yeah, the phone goes around a few minutes later. He says, well, uh, this is a particular kind of fungus. Here's what you do. Here's what you, how do you deal with it? And in about 10 minutes, uh, they had solved the problem. They had diagnosed and solved the problem, okay? The other interesting thing is not only is this knowledge base that they're building in real time, they're also doing data gathering. Uh, they have a tremendous base of data on all aspects of this program. They also are doing crowdsourcing with the farmers. Not only are they pushing scientific knowledge of agricultural practices out, they're gathering information on indigenous practices and bringing it back in, okay? And it's all going into a knowledge base and it's all living, breathing every day. And this is a, because they're funded by Gates, uh, it, it, this is a very data analytics driven organization. And this is real time on the ground analytics. Um, it's just, just amazing to see. So then, I'm gonna leave you here for a second. Um, at the end of this second visit, we asked, well, what has this done? And one lady stands up, she's got a baby cradle under her arm. She says, in the last six months, my crop yield has doubled and I bought a goat. She has an asset now. She's got a place to start, okay? She's learned something. She's learned the scientific method. She's learned how to diagnose and respond, sense and respond, right? And she's got something for it. This has changed her life in a significant way and changed the life of the community. Her child will go to school. Her child will be fed. And maybe, just maybe, that child will be one of those few from that village who will break out of the cycle and will get an education. Okay? And that's how you break the cycle. Okay? Maybe not in her lifetime, but in the child's lifetime. And maybe that child comes back to the village, or maybe that child comes back as a community knowledge worker. That's what Grameen did way back in the days in Bangladesh with microfinance. The most successful borrowers, they put back in as loan officers, okay? The most successful, you know, farmers come back as community knowledge worker. So it's a, it's a self-propagating cycle, okay? So that was day one long drive back to uh, Kampala. And the next four days, we're back in the office, and here's what it looked like. On day two, we sat down with the leadership team. Uh, we showed some videos of our day in the field, which was very inspiring for the folks who were not along. We did some sessions. The first thing we focused on on the first day, we did a Kanban exercise. Everybody on the leadership team of that organization, by the end of the day, had a Kanban board up on the wall. What is their demand? What are they working on? Where are they stuck? And what's done? And then, and this is, this is Sarah, by the way, an amazing lady. She's the one that led our Gemba walk the day before. She's the one that runs all the field operations. And you can tell by the look on her face, she's saying, yeah, we got some problems right here, huh? Um, and these are the leadership Kanban boards making 
visible to everybody what they're working on and the problems they're having. And a couple of hours later, everybody in the whole organization gathered in this room, and it was completely open, completely trusted. That was day one. These Kanban boards are still up, and they're still working every day. Okay. Day two, we said, okay, we need to take a programmatic view of this overall community knowledge worker program. If we're going to take what we've done in Uganda and go to Cote d'Ivoire or go somewhere else and do another domain of knowledge, how are we going to do that? So we started with a blank sheet of paper about you know, 10 feet high and about 20 feet long and some pens. And the day before, we did a quick little straw man of the process ended. We got a couple of the SMEs together and say, tell us just generally what this process looks like. We had enough of a roadmap to start in a blank sheet of paper. By halfway through the first day, this was happening. Okay. I'm sitting down at the back of the room. It took me a while to get the pump right. Okay. But there, uh, I mean, you see, the, how many hands, how many stickies, how, how much activity is going on? There's Sylvia. She's, uh, she's liking this. I don't know what she's saying. And by the end of day two, it looked like this. At the beginning of day two, we kind of did an informal survey. I mean, everybody, these people are hard workers. They are, they, they are, you want to find passion. You want to find shared values. There's that word. You want to share, find shared values? You go talk to these people. They know what they're doing. They work hard every day. We asked every one of them, what's your level of awareness of what you're doing and how it impacts the outcome? And everyone gave it high marks, you know, fours out of fives. By the end of the first day, we went and did that survey again, and everybody says, wow, we thought we knew what we were doing. Anybody heard that before? It's nothing different, nothing different at all. Heroic effort made this happen. And all of a sudden, the pink stickies, of course, everybody knows what the pink stickies are. Those are the problems. By the end of the day, they all took a sober look at their problems and said, we have some work to do. That when, when we came, they had this notion that they needed this thing called an SOP. Standard operating procedures. You know the old ISO binder on the shelf told them how to do everything? By the end of the day, by the end of the two days, they looked at this and went, this is a living, breathing understanding of how we do a community knowledge worker program. So now when we take it to another country or another domain of expertise or another language, we at least have a roadmap of what we know so that we can focus our effort on what we don't know. They get that. They get that so deeply. Okay? And so here is the action plan going forward. Every two weeks, I'm up at 5.30 a.m. and we're on a call with them. We're on a stand-up call. They've got a couple of coaches. Um, the executive director of the Uganda office is a champion. He is the CEO of Uganda, and he is so on board. He is an ex-Nokia employee, by the way. Nokia? Yeah. Nokia. Individuals and teams are maintaining Kanban boards with daily stand-ups. Leadership Kanban with weekly stand-ups. Two key value streams are being examined carefully right now. One of them is the supply chain, returning failed units from the field and getting new units back into their hands quickly. I think the, uh, the uh, turnaround time for a failed phone right now is around three weeks. That's totally unacceptable. You can't leave a whole series of villages down for three weeks, and they know it. Okay? So they're, they're on it. They're working on, on things like this. But you want to talk about impediments? You want to talk about environmental challenges to get a quick phone turnaround in those kind of conditions? Um, when um, uh, about a year ago they had somebody killed for a phone, literally. You know, give me your phone, boom. And the I mean, phone is a huge asset in a, in a very poor country. So they're dealing with impediments like, like we can't even imagine. Okay. Um, Continue to document the entire CKW and the mobile money program value streams, and they're blending them. By the way, one of the things they're doing is now that CKW agriculture is up and running, they want to take what they already know about microlending and slip stream it in so now these villages can do microlending with the same CKW platform, teaching agricultural extension specialists how to be bankers. Although one of the villages we visited on our day one Gamba had already set up their own community savings and microbank. Nobody told them how to do it. They had a charter. They had a constitution. They had a banker. They did it themselves. They needed no help whatsoever. They just, they, they perfectly self-organized and learned themselves. Okay. So it's just amazing. They're uh, practicing scrum techniques on many of their projects. We have a couple of coaches in training. We, um, Jeff Sutherland, 
sent out a tweet a few months ago. Um, and suddenly we have a volunteer coach, a lean and agile coach. He's going to spend six months there, volunteer on a stipended basis. And he shows up there in two weeks. Okay, Those people are out there. You just need to make the space for this to happen. And then um, we're doing regular coaching calls every couple of weeks. And we're planning to go back again sometime next year just to give it a boost, to keep it going. And the awareness of lean. Uh, is spreading throughout the Grameen organization. And guess who showed up the next week after we left and this whole place was wallpapered? Their representative from the Gates Foundation showed up, took one look around and went, wow, what happened here? So we've created a space. There's a lot happening there. Okay. So this is a work in process, as they say. So what I want to do is close this and ask the big hairy questions that have occurred to me in the last year or two. Um, these questions I'm formulating for the first time and sharing them with you here because I can't think of a more perfect audience than it's for these big hairy questions. The first big hairy question is whether it's USAID or the Gates Foundation or a thousand other governmental or non-governmental or private philanthropic funding organizations, guess what they all do? They say, tell me what you're gonna do. I need to think about it for about six months or a year. Then I'll finally give you the money and then you need to tell me what the outcome's gonna be a year from now. So you got a two year cycle in conditions with more, more variables and more change and more unknowns than any for-profit business situation you'll ever see. Yet these folks are on the biggest, hairiest, Big requirements up front, waterfall cycle you've ever seen. And the Gates Foundation is part of this. It's the way it's done. We've got to stop doing that. But we have a big education process ahead of us to do that. Okay? You get it? This, in my mind, if you really go to the root cause of all of this, we've got to way change the way we think about funding these things because the situation on the ground in pick any country around the equator, the situation on the ground today and the situation on the ground in that same country 90 days from now could completely flip on you. Okay. And whatever plan you have funded a year ago isn't relevant anymore. But the people on the ground and the people in the support office are spending a significant percentage of their time to explain why we haven't met our targets yet, why we still need more money, but we can't really, you know, and it's the same old Agile PMO problem. It's just the rate of change is accelerated. We need to get past this. Okay. And this is the conversation <clears throat> that I am having with the Gates Foundation. And I hope some of you, if you have any connections in the philanthropic funding organization community, can have too. They need to know what lean, agile, call it what you will, thinking is. That's one. Two. How do we help NGO and nonprofit leaders think in terms of lean operational excellence on the execution side and on lean, agile, scrum project thinking? Okay. Because if you want heroic efforts, you got heroic efforts. Um, but there needs to be some discipline. There needs to be some PDCA. There needs to be good measurement. There needs to be Hoshin. There needs to be a lot of this. It didn't take very long at all for me to go into Mercy Corps Northwest and get a team together around a core value stream and make a significant improvement and prime the pump and get it going. Um, I'm not going to say all NGO leaders are receptive to that or will know what to do with it and how to take it forward. So we kind of have to pick our battles. But again, do each one of you know one of those? Can you go out and do something like that? Or can you inspire five people in your network to each go out and do something like that? And let's get this leverage thing working for us. Maybe. The third big hairy question, how do we help micro entrepreneurs and communities and public services in the field, in Peru, in Sri Lanka, in uh, Pick, pick a country, any country, and help them think clean too so they can build their education, their capabilities in the education systems, 
in the uh, supply chain sectors and try to make as much of the manufacturing and supply chain activities actually happen in Africa. I was um, at the Agile 2013 conference in Nashville a few weeks ago. I know a few of you were there. And there was a fellow gave a presentation that just knocked our socks off called Balls for Africa, okay? And basically, they have all the capacity and all the leather they need to make as many soccer balls as they need. So why are they importing all of their soccer balls when a soccer ball made out of plastic somewhere else lasts about a month in Africa? When you make a soccer ball out of leather in Africa, it lasts for about six months. Oh, and you happen to employ a bunch of people too, okay? So bring manufacturing, bring the skills, bring the capabilities and keep the money at home, okay? And the guy that was doing this was a ThoughtWorks guy who happened to have a background in lean manufacturing, and now he's doing Agile, and now he's doing this thing in, uh, in, uh, in Africa. And they've got four manufacturing sites going now. There's a, uh, there's a great video. I'm the one that shot it. I won't say it's technically great. I just set up a video camera and let it run, but it's great. And you will find that, too, on the Lean for NGO site called Balls for Africa. Okay. So how do we help micro-entrepreneurs and small businesses help get their feet on the ground, build, build a base of assets, build a, a, a network of suppliers, uh, build the capabilities around them, build communities around them. Um, that's the only way many of these sub-Saharan African countries are ever going to make it. I mean, we can give them handouts to keep them eating on a daily basis, but they, they, they want to do it themselves, but they lack capital, they lack expertise, they lack the support group, and isn't that what Lean is all about? Are those sort of things? So, so if the NGOs are thinking lean and they're acting lean in the field, won't that just rub off a little bit on the people they're serving? And it, particularly if it's through micro-entrepreneurism uh, and if, if lean thinking is made deliberately part of the program, won't that work? Won't that help? I, I, I strongly believe it will. And then the fourth big hairy question, how do we help four profit lean enterprises dedicate a non-trivial percentage of their coaching staff's learning time and investment community outreach. Have any of you seen uh, Toyota's video of what they did in the food bank in New York City? Good, good one. Toyota got a lot out of it. The food bank and the whole organization in New York got a lot out of it. They, they taught the first one, the second one they coached, and from now on it's spreading, okay? Learn to teach. Um, Boeing has done this a little bit. At least they used to do it, I believe, uh, when, uh, years ago. Um, don't all of us in the for-profit organization where we're trying to build coaching expertise wish we had a way that our coaches could go out and get some experience in a venue other than our own dysfunctional organization? Well, there's plenty of nonprofits out there in their own community that could use that help, that could give your coaches that real life experience that you could bring back and go, by the way, make it a part of your CSR program at the same time. Win, win, win. Why aren't organizations doing it? It's just because I don't think anybody's thought about it that way before. Okay. So these are four big contextual questions around this. And um, I just, any, if, Movement on any one of those would be great. Movement on all four would be just uh, amazing. So one thing that happened literally spontaneously in my own hometown, I had a little to do with this, but not a lot. Suddenly, on LinkedIn, there's a Lean Portland group pops up. A young guy uh, at uh, Providence Health Systems, I think. Um, creates a Lean Portland Club, and next thing you know, we got like 50 or 100 members, and they're chatting, and next thing you know, they go out and do one nonprofit activity, and that works pretty well, and now they're working at another, and, and I, I give them what help I can, I give them what support I can, but really, they self-organize, and they're running on their own like this. So I ask, are there other communities, are there other cities out there that could do something like this? I'll bet there are. Um, and this is a perfect example of, uh, of self-organization. So 
What I want to do is close, and then I have a, just a couple of minutes for questions. And then we're going to go to dinner. Um, what next? And this, this what next is not what next for Linker NGO or for Grameen or for me. It's what next for all of you. Um, at the very least, visit www.lean4ngo.org. It's a website. There's a lot of interesting stuff posted there. If any of you have something that should be posted there, send it to me, send me a link, and I'll have it up tomorrow. Um, this is the starfish and the spider. This is a spot you come to share. This is the watering hole. Share, learn, grow, network. Do it over and over and over again. Um, and then sign up for the LinkedIn group. Um, and you will see some amazing stories. You'll see some just amazing stuff going on out there. So at the very least, please go do this. Next, if you or someone that works for you or someone you know that feels an inclination to do this, go out within your own community and find a way to help. Make them a pro bono member of your client portfolio. Piece out a percentage of what you do intentionally and make that a dedication, and you will learn and you will get so much back from that. Third, maybe start a lean club in your area or find somebody you're in your community and say, hey, go look at this lean Portland thing. You think you could, what could be your first experiment? Would your first experiment just be create a LinkedIn group and see who shows up? That's a great first experiment, and then see what happens. That might be a good idea. Talk to one of your clients. Talk to one of Elaine Enterprise about this coaching outreach notion. What a better way to get, um, get some coaches with some outside experience, learning experience. And then finally, just spread the word. Tell stories. Tell as many stories as you can. So what I want to do, the last step before we open this up, is pick up your card again that we started with. <clears throat> Take a moment and look at those three words on that card and ask yourself, has what you've seen, what you've heard here today, would you change any of those three words? If so, cross it out, change it. Now, take that second blank card and write those three words on that card again. <coughs> okay? Just write those three words on the card. So you have two. This is not waste. This is not redundancy. There's a purpose for each of these cards. Um, the new ones. The three words that are your passion, that are your connection uh, between lean systems thinking and service to humanity. What connects you with those? Now, do you have, do each of you have two cards with the same three words? Okay, I want your original one that you crossed out if you did, I want that to go in your pocket. And that means at least once tonight, when you get back to your hotel room, you're gonna to have to take that out of your pocket and make a decision what to do with that. Does it go on the dresser? Does it go somewhere? Does it go in the wastebasket? I don't care, but you have to handle it at least once more. You'll think of this question once more before you go to sleep tonight. The other one, please leave on the table. I'll come pick these up. I'm going to aggregate together. These are anonymous, by the way. I don't want to know your name. But I'm going to take these three words and put them together and see what happens. Or is there an affinity to certain words or certain themes? And I'll publish it. I don't know how tomorrow, but we'll see. So this is my own little small data experiment. So with that, I want to thank you all.